You have found a place to belong here on the Circle of Friends. We are so glad that you've joined around our table to talk about faith and to talk about, um, really to talk about the journey of what it looks like to live a life with Jesus in it. And sometimes it's not pretty. Sometimes it's hard. It's messy. It's a challenge. And, um, you know, really this week has been such a joy. Brenda Mason Young has been with us this week and it's been so good to hear your story, Brenda. So great to be here. Thank you. I, I've, I've loved the different, um, the different stories you've told us in your journey. And if you have missed any of this week, um, just be sure to go to 95.9 The Light and, and try to look up those archived, um, sessions because they've been so good. You've, you've shared really just your story of, of the call of God on your life, the call of ministry on your life, kind of what that has looked like. And it didn't really look like exactly how you thought it would unfold. Sure did not. <laughs> and, and I think there is some, some just not only relatability, but there is some um, validity. It makes me feel, it makes me feel valid in my faith when I hear a leader like you say, I went through a three month period where I felt like I couldn't read the Bible or pray. I was disappointed. I was, you know, I was struggling and it was just almost like a dry season. Mm -hmm. And, but God still just wove his way into your heart in ways that were just a surprise to you, right? Absolutely. And I want to say, I don't think that we should uh, take the fact that we have the Bible for granted. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. But keep in mind, most of the people who are currently in heaven got there without even having a Bible. (laughs) You know, think about that. Right, right. Because God is so real when you trust him that he, that he speaks to you. Um, he, you know, it's a for real relationship. It's, and I can't stress that too much. It's not performance. Yeah, that's it's so good. It's not performance. And, and, you know, we've talked this week about, um, about being disappointed in God. We've talked this week about just um, what it looks like to know and feel the call on his life and, and what it looks like to obey that. But we also, we also have talked about... You know, what it looks like to get to know God. Mm -hmm. You know, when, if you feel, if you, whether you feel challenged or whether you feel called to the ministry, you were talking about how important it is to get to know God and one, some of the practical ways we can do that. One of the ways we can do that is to, to our associations, to associate Mm -hmm. ourselves with people that know God, that, uh, that definitely are walking and making decisions Mm -hmm. that are in line with a Christian lifestyle or a faith lifestyle. The other thing is, um, that you had said was to, um, um, to be in the word, you know, Mm -hmm. to get into the word, to find a mentor, someone you respect and whether it's at work or whether it's in the church, someone Mm -hmm. you respect that you feel like, Hey, I want to be more like that person. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was, I was thinking when we were talking about being in the word and we were talking about praying, you know, praying, um, there's no, you know, the whole formula of praise, surrender, Mm -hmm. worship, you know, there's a, there's a way that they, that, that out there that if you pray by these steps for me, I was raised in a Christian home. And for me, probably my prayer life became the best and the most real when I started really, really praying my heart, like just saying, this is how I'm feeling. This is what I'm, this is, this is what I hope for. This is what I feel. This is, and I really started telling Jesus everything. In fact, that became a mantra for a couple of years. People would say something. I said, just remember to tell Jesus everything. Tell him exactly how you Mm -hmm. feel. Some days it was just, God, I need your help. Mm -hmm. I just need you to help me. I I need your help and, Mm -hmm. and whatever that looks like. And that would be my prayer for the day. There were, there were times I would pray, I need enough strength and I need enough just for today. Mm-hmm. And my head would hit the pillow, and I would remember I prayed that in the morning. I was like, I had enough for today. Yeah. You know, and I don't, I don't, I don't pray formulas anymore at all. I not I, helpful. You don't, you don't talk to your husband through a formula. He'd be un, unimpressed. <laughs> <laughs> he would get bored fast. Yes. 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 Mm-hmm. So I think, don't you think, like for someone listening who who would say, well, I don't even know how to pray, or how do I go about praying? Wouldn't you say that you prayed to God like you would imagine the most perfect father, mm-hmm. like you 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 pray your heart. Right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, for for me, I've often uh, illustrated it with prayer, with my relationship with my husband. You know, we would uh, uh, talk all day 
in short spurts, you know. Uh, we would work together. Oh, I'd so send good. him a text, call on the phone, we, you know, we'd do something um, all day. But there were many days that we did not have long conversations. More days we did not have long conversations yeah. than days that yeah. we did. But we went on dates. And on dates, we'd just talk our heads off, you know. <laughs> so awesome. When we had the opportunity and the energy to just be by ourselves, we were like chatterboxes. You couldn't shut it off. And I found that is very helpful with me and God to, on a normal basis, you know, don't try to perform, don't put pressure on myself, but give myself a date with God and just go sit, you yeah, know, just so go good. sit, just get quiet and don't have a lot of, uh, Charlie and I, you know, we had some planned dates. Um, and they were always great fun. And I think planning a retreat with God where you have, you know, a schedule mm-hmm. you're going to read and you're going to do this and all of that is really good. But many of our most fulfilling dates were just spontaneous where we talked about what was ever on our heart, you know, in a fuller fashion than we did in those short spurts all day yeah, long. So and and I think that is it. That's a relationship. And we forget that this is a relationship with God, not a performance for God. It's not trying to earn our way in. We are in. We are in. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so we, you know, we just, um, yeah, just that. Just yeah, good. talk our heart. You know, you were sharing earlier this week that um, Charlie had said to you that the year 2019 was going to be oh the year my. of Brenda. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and, that, and, and you said it took a really weird twist. What do you, I mean, um, tell, us, tell us about that. Now, you and Charlie, tell us about how long you're married. Uh, June fifteenth would have been our forty fifth wedding anniversary, and as I told you, we were together for four years before that. Um, it it took an odd twist that I could have never imagined. Uh, Charlie was healthy. His you know his heart doctors had said he was you know doing great and all of that. The, the physical thing is too long to tell you, but his um, his struggle, which is why some people thought that he was ill and you know that he died of an illness, was because he had a knee replacement. You guys know how insurance and all that kind of stuff works. Mark. They put him through a long, long a whole series. The whole p- period of time took about eighteen months, where um, they didn't didn't fix that knee. They kept doing shots and doing you know a variety of things, and so uh, during that period of time. He fell 15 times where his knee just gave out on him. And that damaged his other knee and his back. Made his back compress. It was really bad. So then the insurance companies, I do not understand this, but they said he had to go to rehab uh, to try that out before they would do the surgery on his back, which would release it. We were concerned about him eventually becoming paralyzed because he was having numbness. In fact, my last couple of texts from him, he was telling me how his hands were not working right, you know, that morning. Um, And it was all because of the neck compression. So one thing, you know, there were just a lot of things in there that we couldn't understand why they were happening. And and he was never uh, a discouraged guy. He had... Faith. However, after he did pass away, I got his Bible back that he had just gotten for Christmas, and um, the introduction to the Book of Matthew. In the uh, it was the Swindoll Study Bible. The introduction to the Book of Matthew said um, that the Book of Matthew was written to uh, the Jews, to believers who uh, hadn't heard from a prophet, hadn't heard from God in over four hundred years, and they were discouraged. They were feeling like God had forsaken them, and it asked the question. Do you ever wonder why God is silent for you? And my faith-filled husband, I had almost never seen him have a doubt, had written in there, and I didn't see it until after he was with the Lord, uh, but he had written, yes, right now. So he was experiencing that himself, you know, because he didn't understand why this was happening, why it couldn't get taken care of. Well, I won't go into the details of this, but on the weekend of January 20th, when we had the big snow uh, around here, um, he was... uh, in he was in rehab i felt great concern about him but not that he was going to die that he was going to be paralyzed uh he had gone there on uh at the beginning the first week of january and it was now january 20th and on tuesday he was supposed to go to cleveland clinic and what we anticipated was that he would finally be admitted that day and they would take care of the surgery um on but i felt a sense of foreboding when i when i went to see him on 
on Sunday, and you know, I stayed down there as long as I could. My kids and I had seen a difference in him on Saturday, and he he had he was retaining a lot of fluid. Um, one of the heart doctors said that was because they didn't keep him moving enough. Mm. But mm-hmm. uh, like I said, I won't go there. But they made two major medical mistakes at this rehab place, and they cost him his life. That was very hard to take. That this was an unnecessary death. You know, mm. should not have happened. Um, they. I went home from seeing him on uh, Sunday afternoon because it had started to snow real bad again, and he sent me home. So I got home at about a quarter after four, and I came in, and I sat down in his recliner um, because it felt comforting. And I told Jesus, I said, Jesus, put me to sleep. I don't like what I'm thinking. And so um, I went to sleep again. I wasn't thinking that he would die. And my girlfriend, who uh, rents an apartment from us, came in and checked on me and she said do you want to play scrabble charlie and i always play scrabble and she knew it would you know kind of keep my mind occupied and so we did we played scrabble but my my mind was on charlie and i started texting him he wasn't he wasn't uh calling me back and um i was just desperate you know to hear from him to know if his hands were worse what was going on and at 8 15 my watch started to rumble which i knew it was a phone call and i picked up my phone i looked at it and it said pebble creek 8 14 when i picked it up they said we have your husband he's unresponsive and i knew he was gone in that instant i knew he was gone even though i had never considered that he would leave me and there's so many things i could tell you there but the most important thing to share is i felt a combination of the greatest disappointment in god i had ever felt I had begged them to send him to the hospital on Friday, and they told me I was making a mountain out of a molehill, hill, that there was nothing wrong, that I was going to have him for 20 more years. And, uh, and so I had the greatest disappointment in God, but also I had the greatest sense of trust all the way to the, to the rehab center, and it was only like, you know, it took us like two minutes to get there from my house. I was saying aloud, I can hear myself saying it now, Jesus, I know he's with you. I don't understand, but I love you. And um, C.S. Lewis said something, and this kind of harkens back to what you said about your son and what I told you before about God disappointing me. C.S. Lewis said that God has to shatter mm. his image, that the image that we have of him, mm. in mm. order for us to truly know him. Now, I have been shattered a lot in my lifetime. I have MG, which is an incurable disease, which um, makes my life a lot harder in a lot of ways than it should be. Uh, you know, when I became a woman pastor, um, on on one in one week, 60 people left the church because I had been appointed as pastor and I was a woman. I could go through so many things. Our daughter was molested by a church member, and we did the best we could to protect. I've had so many shatterings, so many. But the season that I have been in right now is without a doubt the greatest. Yes. You know, I, I have seen you walk through that and navigate that, and part of my thinking of you being a guest on the show was to share some of the ways that you've navigated loss and hurt and disappointment in your faith, within faith, within Mm -hmm. your trust in God. Um, because I think it's so vital for us all to hear, how do we navigate the hurt Mm -hmm. and the loss? So stick around. We're going to just take a short break and we'll be right back here on the circle of friends. Looking for ways to change up your living space? Stop by Village Gift Barn and view our wide selection of house and home items. Need some tips on how to pull together a room? One of our talented home decor staff will help you put together the perfect arrangement for your home. Located in the heart of Amish country on State Route 39 in Berlin. Village Gift Barn. Never ordinary. We promise.
here on the Circle of Friends, and we are so glad that you've joined us today. Um, We're talking about seasons of grief and loss and disappointment in God, Mm -hmm. really. I mean, it's it's real, um, and um, in our Christian walk, even if we're not in Christian faith, right? Exactly. We're all going to face hardship mm-hmm. and brokenness mm-hmm. and loss in our life, and so you know, Brenda, we were talking about um, Charlie's death, your sweetheart of forty, well, forty-five years married, but then four 40, years together before that, forty-nine before that, forty-nine. Yeah. So, and really, I mean, we've left out big parts. You yes. know, your, your your father passed away, who was that's just, what I was going to say. It was just such an incredible. Yeah part of your life Mm -hmm. and your sister well here the season before leading up to this i thought i had Mm -hmm. experienced a lot but in in the last it will be three years in august it'll be three years these are the things that happened besides you know the smaller losses like we we had two dogs died that had been part of our family for a long time and you know those are hard and and um just you know lots of lots of small losses that are normal parts of life but in the three years uh at the end of August, I I had to have ankle surgery to repair something that had happened years before and, and had not healed right. They thought it would fix it. It made it worse. I had been making, I had been walking eight miles a day. I've been unable to do that. I can't even walk a mile anymore. The, the pain is too great. Mm. Um, like I said, I, I got diagnosed with an uh, incurable disease. And I, uh, as we talked before about how, how, things can be painful. Um, I got a letter addressed to me. Um, the, the return address said, uh, your heavenly father, I thought it was going to be a wonderful letter. I opened it up and it was this letter just tearing me apart. Uh, you know, talking from God's viewpoint, telling me that the disease that I had gotten uh, was a judgment from God on my life because I was doing something that he had never told me to do and that my children were cursed and all of these kinds of things that just just went on. The way, though, that that's kind of funny that I knew, you know, that there was no way this person was speaking for God was uh, God said to me in this letter, supposedly, I have heard your anguished prayers for healing. There had never been one of those (laughs) slip out of my mouth or even in my thoughts because I already for a long time have been praying whatever. And I never, I, you know, I just, I said to God, whatever, if this is the best way you can use me, have at it, you know, do whatever. I don't need to be healed. So, but those, those kinds of things, the weekend that I had my surgery, I was sitting in the chair, uh, foot up when we got the call that my niece had walked in and uh, found her mother, my best friend besides my husband, um, had left us for heaven sitting on the couch. Mm. And I couldn't is this, even... Is this your older sister? This, this is my older, older sister, sister, 19 months older than me. And um, and I couldn't even go to be with my niece because I just had the surgery. So mm. Charlie left. And 
And I felt it was so symbolic of what God was doing to me that he left and Charlie left to be with Jennifer because he needed to be. And I was alone in the house within five minutes of finding out that my sister was gone. And we thought it was going to be her husband because he already had sepsis. He was in the hospital very ill. And uh, so, so anyways, that happened. And it was the same weekend that we had, that we started our second campus. And um, wow. so it was a it was quite a weekend. Jeannie's funeral on the day that the church opened, and I was able to uh, go and speak at her funeral and all of that. But that was all that was all difficult. Then David was never able to recover, and there were so many things happened um, that uh, we left our denomination um, in a punishing uh, decision for us. They took our church from our church building from us. We lost our building in that process. Uh, and we did it because we we knew that this is what God was telling us to do in order to minister to the poor of our community. We couldn't afford it and afford what they were charging us. On the mm. other hand, and so um, they took our building, which we you know it was ours, but we had to go to court. We didn't believe God wanted us to do that, so this all happened like in the months that went right there together. And I, I have never been anything but that denomination my whole life. I was born into it. So I lost years of colleagues. I'd been highly mm-hmm. respected, even nominated for Bishop multiple times, you know, uh, lots of things there, but, you know, essentially lost that. All of these losses just crashing in and crashing in. And then, um, our neighbor who was, uh, one of my best friends, she got cancer and died. I had her funeral a year ago, June. Um, and then my brother-in-law, David, was never able to recover. His his um, his death was long and excruciating, um, but he died June 19th last year, and I was with him and the girls when he died, and they've kind of become my surrogate. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm... So I'm, sweet. Yeah. Uh, sometime... Too long of a story for today, but I have an incredible story about how God showed up in that. It, it was miraculous in that situation. Mm. So God's presence was very real all the time that this was going on. In that, just before David died in September, my dad died, and you know he was he was my you know board of directors. He was mm. like chairman of the board. Yes. He and Charlie shared yes. that title, and so you know all of this grief just like compounding, and oh, yes. you know and you know people feeling like we did the wrong thing by leaving the church and all of this. And Charlie had been my handholder. Yes. All the way through mm. this, he was my, he was my, um, he was my balancer. He was yes. always my balance, and he believed in me so in much. Such a safe place. Yes, completely safe. Understood everything. You know, he believed in me. Um, he helped me stay on the right track. It was so great, and I felt so bereft. I felt like, God, what are you doing? You're going to take my kids next? You know what's going on yes. here? You know, I felt those things, but in the middle of it, I had this absurd peace it was like you know i'm asking him questions but i'm not mad at him i never felt an an instance of anger just absolute confusion and as i told you you know c.s lewis said that god has to image he has to shatter our image of him often multiple times until we really get to know him and in this shattering process of having charlie go to heaven i i never say i've lost him because I know exactly where he is, right, and right. I feel his presence with right. me. Mm-hmm. And uh, but in, it's not like having him here. That's for sure. It's not like that. And I, I have felt, um, I have felt a sense of wonderment at God. But you know, Job says, "I." It's in uh, Job forty-two verse five. He said, "My ears had heard about you, but now my eyes have seen you." And I believe that that's been the treasure of the darkness that I have had. I have seen God in a totally new way. I, And it's not, this is one of the things that makes me excited for heaven. Because if, if, you, would have, if you would have told me um, after my sister died and my dad died and David died, if you would have told me that I could know God better than I did then, I would have thought, well, I've... I pretty much hit the bottom. I think I know him pretty well. <laughs> I didn't know there were bottoms yet to come, you know, and I didn't know it's really it's really when we're reaching up that we get to know yes. him, you know. Mm. And uh, and I will tell you I have there's a sense of reality and peace about God that I have never known before. I could tell you so much about how he carried us through that night. My kids 
my kids have been utterly devastated. I still, um, I still char pay Charlie's phone bill every month because um, our oldest son calls the phone every day just to hear his dad's voice. Uh, yeah. And um, they just, you know, uh, Jacob said to me, he said, Mom, if, if you live, if if things, if if we live out, you know, our lives the way I think, if I, if I live to be as old as you, you're going to have had your dad 36 years longer than I've had mine. That breaks your heart as a mom. Yes, you know, you yes, don't. Yes. But the thing is, we had a no regrets life. Absolutely none. I deal I'm with two families this week that I, I have two funerals. Um, and with both of those families, their regret is so high. Mm, their pain yes. is so great. Things that they didn't do, they should have done. Things they should have done, they didn't do. I just thank God because we didn't live that way. Yes. You know, yes. we didn't live that way. So there's nothing, as our son Jacob said at Charlie's funeral, he said, our tears are not because of things that didn't happen that should have or things that happened that should have. He said, our, our tears are because life has been so awesome and we just want more. Yeah, I was thinking about... When you were talking about peace, I was thinking about you. You're defining the peace that passes right any mm. understanding. Yes, like absolutely. Like you can't explain it, you can't define it. It's just a peace that overrides absolutely. every emotion, everything. And and I was also thinking when you were talking how what a treasure and what a gift it is to miss something. Oh, you know. Yes. Uh, and, and and families that you do funerals of that ha their regret levels high. So you know, my my dad recently passed away, and I'm I'm sad because of the way things were. Yeah. I'm sad it wasn't different. I'm mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not sad for any other reason. Exactly, I and I can sh shed hotter tears over your situation than over mine. Yes, because I don't call my dad's phone to hear right. his voice. Mm -hmm. You know that is. To have a, a presence mm. and a person and a life in your life that's so impactful that you would still pay the phone bill mm. so he could hear his dad's voice is a treasure beyond anything that you can touch or buy right. or, I agree. you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's a true gift. And, you know, I, I think it speaks to, it speaks to parenting. It speaks of being a person of character. It speaks to really walking out true godly faith and character to your children and to the people around you be a person be the person that needs their phone bill paid for months mm -hmm. after you have gone to heaven because your children want to hear your voice be that person mm -hmm. you know how do you be that person well i think you can give us some pointers as we move forward on how to be that person things that things that charlie even said and did before his death are in unreal so please stay tuned please come back and and be with us again um you have found a place to belong here at the circle of friends thanks to generous donations this program is produced by circle of friends ministries you can write to us at p.o box 345 Berlin, Ohio, 44610, or contact us at 330-852-0000. You've found a place to belong.